Hello everyone, I'm Mike. Hi, I'm Ivalo. And we'll be presenting the uh, WEA uh, webinar entitled uh, Wind Turbine Fault Detection and Diagnostic Case Studies, Intermediate Shaft Bearing Looseness. I'll be your moderator and Ivalo will be your presenter. We are incidentally calling from the Bulling Care Vibro Monitoring and Diagnostic Center in Denmark and we welcome you all to this uh, webinar. Um, Keisha explained already a lot of the uh, logistics of working with the, um, the webinar here, and I'll just um, repeat some of the things, uh, some of the practical information. Um, we will um, um, ask questions, and uh, these are polling questions. Um, from time to time throughout the uh, presentation. And um, your feedback on this is very, very important for us to prepare and refine, fine tune our future webinars. We'll also um, be taking in questions, um, your questions as we um, go through the webinar. And we won't be able to answer the questions till the end of the webinar, so, but please send in the questions as you have them, as you have them and they come up. And um, the um, polling questions, of course, um, your replies will be visible to everyone and uh, it will be a, a graph form for everyone to see. And um, so you can get a, an idea on uh, how the other people are responding. Information about downloading the webinar will be given at the end. And as Keisha mentioned, if you have any connection problems, there's a toll-free number on the left you can use to uh, and get help. Um, just a short summary of this webinar. The, um, the subject of this webinar is condition monitoring case studies. And uh, this is um, a little bit uh, technical. The intended audience includes condition monitoring specialists, maintenance managers, service providers, original equipment manufacturers, reliability and asset managers, owners, operators, and others. And basically the purpose is to provide technical experience in detecting and diagnosing wind turbine drivetrain faults. Uh, I think now I can present the speaker, Ivalo Dragiev. Uh, he has a master's degree in marine engineering from 2002. From that time he's been working as a marine engineer for a number of companies in the marine sector before switching to the wind industry with Vestas. There he worked as a technical support and condition monitoring system responsible in the service department from 2008 until 2014. Currently he works as a diagnostic engineer for Bloom Care Vibro in the remote diagnostic center in Narum, Denmark. He holds an ISO Master Vibration Analyst uh, Level 4 certification in vibration diagnostics. And his research interests are condition monitoring systems and machine fault diagnosis for wind turbines. Okay, I can give some brief information about the company as well. Blue and Care Vibro has been producing machine monitoring systems for seven years now. And more than 10 years, we have been producing dedicated condition monitoring systems for the wind turbine industry. Today, there are around 7,000 wind turbines being monitored worldwide. Bloom Care Vibro has four monitoring and diagnostic centers in the US, China, and Denmark. After many years in providing uh, turnkey monitoring solutions for thousands of wind turbines of all sizes and makes, we have a fairly large database with a wide range of wind turbine component faults that have been detected and, and diagnosed over the time. Our measurement techniques are continuously refined as a result of this large amount of data. And I want to say, uh, in our effort to help the industry reduce the life cycle cost of their wind turbines and optimize machine availability, we, we want to share our expertise with you. Okay. Before we get started, I want 
to ask um, our first polling question. Um, we we want to know basically what work you're doing in the company. So please take a moment to answer uh, this question. While you're answering, maybe I can give you some background information. As mentioned before, this webinar focuses on case studies of fault detection and diagnostics of uh, wind turbine drivetrain components. And this, of course, is a basic concept for condition monitoring. And by maximizing production and minimizing life cycle costs, condition monitoring brings benefits to all the stakeholders, not just to the uh, maintenance department. Alrighty, looking at the results, uh, we can see um, it's um, uh, distributed a lot among, um, there is um, a condition monitoring uh, group um, dominating and and there's a large group that are not actually on the list, others. But um, but basically, um, I feel there's a better understanding, if there's a better understanding of the condition monitoring among all the employees in the company, the, it'll be easier to make important operation and maintenance decisions across the company. Alrighty. Um, now we can begin the webinar. This is a, an overview. There are basically two case studies, and both deal with uh, bearing looseness on the intermediate speed uh, shaft of the gearbox, but at opposite ends. The potential consequential damage by either bearing fault is significant, as we'll see in the uh, webinar. We will present these um, case studies in, um, in this special format, in this uh, manner. We first present the machine component that is affected by the case study, and then we'll show the uh, monitoring strategy used on that particular component. Then we go into the uh, case study looking at the uh, detection and diagnostic techniques used on the fault. We will look at the results and the feedback, and finally give the uh, condition monitoring benefits of detecting the fault early. Then we'll wrap it all up, um, the uh, webinar, with a conclusion. Alrighty. Um, without further ado, I will hand it over to Ivalo now. Thanks, Mike, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Hi again, everyone. This three-stage gearbox configuration uh, which you see here consists of one planetary stage and two parallel stages. It's one of the most commonly seen for two megawatt uh, wind turbine platforms. For further reference, the site coupled to the main shaft is called rotor site and the one coupled to the generator is called generator site of the gearbox. In general, much attention is given to the planetary stage due to fault detection complexity, low speed rotation and so on. However, it is also a challenge for detecting faults accurately in the helical stages. Here are the three parallel stage shafts, low speed shaft, intermediate shaft, and high speed shaft. In this webinar, our, our focus will be on support bearings for the intermediate shaft. From now on, I will call it uh, IMS for brevity. This is a zoom view of the IMS, and in some cases, this shaft will also be called a second, second intermediate shaft, as it stands in counting order after the low speed shaft. The IMS has two gears, pinion, which is meshing with the low speed shaft, and gear wheel, which is meshing with the high speed shaft. And it's typically supported by three bearings. As you can see, one bearing on the rotor side, and two pairs face-to-face -face at the generator site. Here you could also see the location of the rotor site support bearing, which is the bearing with the defect included in case 31. Let's talk about the monitoring strategy and sensor layout. This uh, is a typical vibration sensor layout for a three-stage gearbox of this type. All the sensors are accelerometers. There is one sensor mounted at the planetary stage, 
one mounted at generator side of IMS, and two sensors mounted at the high speed shaft, front and rear. And of course, we also have a tackle for speed count. As you could see, there is no sensor mounted closely to the bearing of interest at the rotor side of IMS, so the analysis should be a combination of the data recorded at the other sensors. Here only one sensor is indicated, but it can be from several. Vibration transmission path could differ a bit depending on the specific gearbox model and design, however, should be taken into consideration. Here is a list of some of the detection techniques used. In general, we used different broad and narrow band measurements. These have been specifically created and modified over the years for increasing the detection rate. For case 31, the narrow band measurements used are the fundamental tooth mesh frequencies for the second and third stage and their respective harmonics, along with tracking filters mostly for monitoring shaft running speed orders. Broad band measurements include overall vibration level in acceleration and residual value which measures the RMS value of the tooth mesh frequency sidebands. Here it is important to mention that all these measurements are split into five different power classes. The wind turbines are variable speed machines and this helps data classification. We also have individual alarm limits for each power beam. On the diagnostic side, we use traditional techniques like FFT, envelope spectrum, and time waveform analysis. This table summarizes both the detection and the diagnostics. Under the technique column, you could see the names of the different measurements used. First tooth mesh frequency plus harmonics residual value, which I mentioned in the previous slide, and shaft 1x plus running speed orders. Alarming is based on trends crossing the respective alert thresholds. This column also includes the diagnostic techniques. Here you could see a plot which is showing the residual value and second tooth mesh frequency for the third stage. As you can see, the second tooth mesh frequency is crossing the alert limit, which is here with the yellow line, before the residual value trend, because it represents misalignment signature, while the residual value represents the load variation. Hence, the residual value contains the energy of the tooth mesh frequency sideband. In this particular case, the misalignment occurs before the load variation, which itself develops at later stage. On this plot, we can focus on the diagnosis. FFT reveals unusual picture for both second and third stages. Usually, the tooth mesh frequencies are always present in the spectrum with some amplitude, and normally the first tooth mesh frequency has the highest amplitude. As you could see, this is not the case for both second and third stages here. Instead, we see significantly higher levels for tooth mesh frequencies, harmonics, second, third, and so on, which indicates gear misalignment. Additionally, there could be shaft running speed orders generated by the rotational looseness at IMS rotor side bearing, but these are not shown here. On the bottom plot, you could also see that there is a bearing defect frequency generated from the IMS generator side inboard bearing. PPFO, or ball passing frequency out arrays, is assessed to be present due to a defect in the load zone of the stationary out arrays. The rotor end bearing looseness can change the shaft dynamics, which increases the load on the generator side bearings. And what are the results? 
Normally diamet rotor side bearing is mounted without a bearing box directly in the gearbox housing. This makes the up tower repair difficult or impossible. We have just received uh, information that there is an up tower fix if the fault is detected early enough and the gearbox manufacturer says the solution will lock the outer ring of the bearing to prevent movement. Looseness or creeping outer race in housing results in excessive clearance and abnormal shaft movement creating shaft misalignment. There are several, sorry, just to come back, and there are several descriptors which could be used for detection as the first, uh, first foot mesh frequency plus harmonics, residual value, and shaft speed orders. Here are some other interesting facts. Oil analysis gave no indication of gearbox housing wear. Misalignment of the parallel stages often leads to tooth damage on the IMS gears and the high speed shaft pinion, plus raceway damage at IMS generator side bearings. Without proper monitoring, replacement of only the damaged bearings and gears will not solve the problem and there will be damage again. What you can see here are the IMS and high speed shafts. So the excessive clearance in the IMS rotor side bearing could lead to damage of many components as shown in this case. It will create misalignment It can also lead to hard end contact and scuffing marks on generator side of the meshing gears. Additionally, there will be damage on IMS generator side bearings, mostly raceway defects. It could also lead to abnormal operation of the mechanical oil pump, which is coupled directly to the high speed shaft. Here is a video that we will see shortly, and this video we received from the inspection initiated after one of our alarm reports. The viewing position is from the planetary stage inspection cover. You could see the rotor side of the IMS, and the arrows are connect connection between the sketch and the way the components look at the picture. Okay, <clears throat> before we play the video, I just want to make a quick uh, remark here. Some of you may not be able to see the video because of uh, firewall restrictions. Uh, so please bear with us. I just want to just summarize by saying, basically the videos are showing visually this um, looseness of the shaft, movement of the shaft. Okay, so the, the viewing point is, uh, as I said, from the first stage inspection cover. And this video will demonstrate the radial movement of the shaft. Before I start the video, I want to explain that this is not so e it is not so easy to see the shaft rudeness in the video. We have to look carefully at the IMS shaft cover plate. No, it's not this one. I hope you can see it. And here there is another viewpoint from the parallel stage inspection cover. Again, we have connected the, the viewing point with the arrows. So this video, the service brake is applied at uh, low rotational speed. And you could see the radial movement of the shaft. There is an elbow fitting, which is a good reference, as this uh, elbow, elbow fitting is uh, stationary. No, it's not this one. There it is. Yeah. Should we play it again, or we can play one more time? Yeah, let's let's just play it for. Look at the elbow, and now we have stop there, and the radio play of the shaft could be seen.
As mentioned earlier, the meshing gears will be affected as a result from misalignment. Cuffing and hard end contact marks could be seen on the active flanks of the teeth. Generator side bearing has damage on outer ring and wear pitting on the rollers. The IMS rotor side bearing surface has been discolored gray, probably caused by worn metal from the gearbox housing. So here are some quick calculations. What are the benefits from having CMS system installed? For early bearing looseness detection, if the looseness is detected early, uh, the gearbox could be monitored by the diagnostic team closely and left in run till the replacement gearbox arrives on site. In such a way, the cost will include only four or five days of downtime, most likely in a low wind period, plus the cost of the gearbox and crane. The second case could be with IMS gear problem observed, but bearing looseness not detected, so root cause not found. This will include replacement of the IMS shaft and bearings, which is normally done via modification of the internal service crane, but could also, be, uh, could also include an external crane, which will increase the cost significantly. We have taken in, into consideration a case with internal crane modification, such IMS plus bearing replacement normally takes five to six days. The new shaft will still run under misalignment condition, misaligned condition and over the time, this will lead to a new gear damage and possible secondary damages. At this stage, the failure will be much more severe and further gear operation may not be possible. Hence, we take calculation of longer downtime as this is an unexpected stop. In total, the net savings are more than 80,000 US. As we already mentioned, we recently received a notification from one of the gearbox manufacturers that there is an up-tower solution to fix the bearing outer ring to the gearbox housing, if detected early enough. This significantly, significantly increases the savings. Wow, okay. That was uh, case study one. Thank you, uh, Ivalo. Um, it's um, a lot of money, $44,000 wasted basically for each uh, intermediate stage um, uh, shaft change. That can be expensive uh, until the user actually discovers that it's uh, a worn gearbox bearing hole that is causing the damage. Um, I understand, uh, Ivalo, this case study and the one that follows were based on several events, not just one. Were there um, uh, actual cases where a customer changed their um, IMS uh, inadvertently? Yeah, thanks for the question, Mike. Yes, indeed, uh, we had uh, such a case. Uh, where one customer had a damaged tooth on IMS pinion and decided to replace the entire shaft assembly. Two months later, the same fault uh, occurred on the new shaft, and this time the customer decided to follow our recommendation to measure the clearance between the bearing and the housing, which turned out to be excessive. Interesting. Alrighty, thanks again, but uh, before we start on case study two, I want to remind you all that you can send in questions uh, now um, if you have questions on uh, case study one or any comments you have, um, but we um, will wait until we're finished with case study two to answer these for uh, both case studies. So, um, Ivalo, I, I think we're ready for case study two now. Okay, thanks, Mike. So we are moving forward to case 32. What you see again is the uh, IMS. Case 32 covers inner race to shaft looseness for IMS generator side outboard bearing. Here the sensor layout is identical to the one mentioned in case 31. What makes the detection a bit easier here is that the IMS sensor is mounted close to the bearing with the defect. Here 
Here we use again different broad and narrow band measurements. Um, narrow band measurements include tooth mesh frequencies, their harmonics, and tracking filters, shaft running speed orders. Broadband measurements include overall vibration, in acceleration, high frequency crest factor, residual value, and developed condition unit, and other proprietary specialized measurements. For the diagnostic, we use again techniques like uh, FFT, and developed spectrum, and time waveform analysis. I just want to explain quickly quickly what uh, high frequency crest factor is because it's important for the detection of this failure mode. This is the ratio of the peak amplitude to the average amplitude or RMS value in the sine wave form. And in this figure, here you could see an example for a pure sine wave. High frequency crest factor demonstrate peakiness of a signal where faults show themselves as uh, peak values. Amongst others, it is one of the frequently used measurements for detection of rolling element bearing defects. It also detects uh, all kinds of faults that are impact related. Again, the table summarizes both the detection and the diagnostics. However, what is different is that in this case, there are two clear stages of fault development, as you will see on the next slide. The first one includes the stage of initial hairline crack on bearing interlace. And here we mainly see a response from the crest factor and the ECU. The second stage of development includes several descriptors. High frequency crest factor again, ECU, residual value, shaft 1x plus running speed orders. Alarming is based on trends crossing the respective alert and danger thresholds. Diagnostic. Diagnostics includes, uh, include, again, uh, traditional techniques like uh, time waveform analysis, FFT, and envelope. Here we will focus on the high frequency crest factor and uh, ECU plots. So the first step change you see here is related to initial hairline crack, which has appeared on bearing inner rays. This is the moment where the high frequency crest factor trend is crossing the alert limit, which is shown with the yellow color. The second step change is where the bearing creep indeed has occurred, and then you see much more steep progression. The flat trend at the right side of the plot. is the normal ice level levels after the gearbox replacement. And here is a view of the residual value trend, showing a step change when fault development stage 2 has begun. So the residual value in this case is not the most sensible descriptor for this failure mode. And there are several more plots showing the envelope and outer spectrum in acceleration for stages 1 at the top and stage 2 at the bottom. As you could see, for development stage 2 leads to much more severe condition affecting second stage gear mesh. Also, there are multiple si sidebands around the tooth mesh frequency due to the increased uh, load variation. Here, the results and the feedback. The bearing creep was presumably caused by an actual crack in the inner race, which has led to improper bearing fit on the shaft. Bearing creep typically occurs with rolling element bearings. And sever severity development rate and frequency of the bearing fault depends on turbine loading, gearbox and bearing design, etc. Bearing inner race hairline cracks and spalling can be detected early using high frequency crest factor and enveloped condition unit. And bearing creep can be detected by high frequency crest factor, residual value, ECU, shaft running speed orders, and at late stage, the overall vibration measurements. Once bearing creep has started, it's imperative to stop the machine as soon as possible to prevent secondary damage to the shaft and other stage related components.
Here are some pictures received from the endoscope inspection of this bearing. Some pittings and dents could be seen on the bearing in the race. And this is the fault development stage one uh, axial hairline crack on bearing in the race. And this picture now shows multiple cracks already present at fault development stage 2, leading to bearing creep. Some quick cal calculations of the benefits from detecting the problem with CMS. Early detection means that only the bearing could be replaced, which leads to short periods of downtime and inexpensive repair. Failing to detect the problem in fault stage development 1 will lead to secondary damage, which could require either IMS assembly replacement or complete gearbox replacement. And again, the net savings could be significant. Wow, so so people, that's obviously, um, we can see there's a big difference in savings depending on how early the fault was detected. Um, so, Ivalo, I have um, another question for you. Um, um, how much lead time is there between the time when the bearing fault is first detected, such as that um, hairline crack we saw in the photo, until the uh, bearing creep begins? Yeah. Well, there is no simple answer to this question. Uh, so, as the bearing creep begins, uh, the bearing creep itself begins when there is uh, insufficient surface contact between the inner race and the shaft. And I've seen cases where the hairline cracks didn't progress for periods of several months up to over a year, but in other cases the uh, defects uh, could develop rapidly. So, when the creep begins, uh, the inner race opens and the lubrication of fills the gap between the ring and the shaft. So in such case, this bearing could even uh, behave to some degree like a journal bearing. But to summarize, um, there are a lot of factors which decline, uh, define the initiation and uh, progression of the faults. So among these are uh, the wind condition on site, gearbox design, what are, what are the bearing material properties and oil condition and so on. So there is no simple answer on proportion. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. But um, <clears throat> because there's so many factors, it's, um, it's, uh, it's obviously not possible to predict the lead time to creep. So this uh, basically uh, reinforces the need for condition monitoring for this particular potential failure mode. Alrighty, thanks again, Ivalo. Okay, this concludes uh, case study two. So um, again, please send in your questions, um, answers for case study one and two will be given after the conclusion and after um, we'll give a couple of polling questions also. Um, now I'm going to let uh, Ivalo conclude the um, um, both uh, case studies. So we, what we could draw as a conclusion here is um, that we have to use the specialized skills of measurement, for example, shaft running speed orders, high frequency crest factor, tooth mesh frequencies, and residual value to detect bearing looseness early and avoid excess clearance due to wear. Diagnostic expertise and machine knowledge is needed to distinguish between bearing faults and looseness and avoid unnecessary costly service. What is very important to have a proper communication line between the condition monitoring provider, uh, owners and operators and service providers in order to localize the problem. So if bearing rudeness is detected, this should be treated as high severity alarm and requires immediate action to avoid catastrophic failure of the gearbox. And it has to be, uh, you have to be proactive in planning service regardless of if it's uh, the outer or the inner race rudeness. Great. Sounds great. Thanks again, Ivalo. Alrighty, everyone. We are now coming to uh, polling question number two. So as before, Please uh, submit your answers now. 
while you're answering, um, I want to remind you that this question is, is basically indirectly connected to the first polling question where we asked what kind of work you're doing. It is um, our intention to balance the technical detail that meets you know, the expectations of the participants. And again, this information will be used as feedback for fine-tuning uh, the next uh, webinars. So um, I can see there is um, a lot of consensus that um, everyone agrees with the way we presented it in the technical details we did, so the, I'm happy to see that. So thanks for your answers, everyone. Okay, we're getting some, though, where, um, yeah, but maybe uh, with more technical details, actually. Okay, I'm, I'm really interested in the uh, results here, but we'll get back to that. Um, now, we have another polling question. I'll keep you on your toes here. Uh, this one is basically um, um, your area of interest um, in seeing uh, CMS uh, case studies, webinars, for which components are the most relevant. Um, the reason for this question is to allow us to pri prioritize our next uh, coming case study webinars. We have a lot of uh, case studies covering uh, basically a lot of uh, potential theory modes for all these components and more. But if you want to be more specific, for example, you're interested in case studies dealing specifically with uh, planetary gears, for example, please send in your comment with that request. And uh, we have hundreds of case studies on planetary gears as we do with all the other components. Alrighty. So I can see um, basically <laughs> There is a uh, consensus where there's an interest for all the components, and, and I'm happy to see that. Alrighty, we have our last polling question. Thanks for bearing with me on this. Um, this one will help us understand better the technology and techniques you're using. And just as a reminder, um, and we are often presenting papers and attending various wind energy conferences in uh, Europe and USA. So you're welcome to come by our stand or, or contact our specialists attending these conferences to, to discuss your monitoring system requirements with us. And Or, of course, you can always drop us a line or, um, or look at our website. And, uh, uh, yeah, I can see there is a, um, um, a big interest divided between those who are interested in the uh, specialized measurements, narrow band, and those who um, haven't made any specific decision on a monitoring strategy there. All right, but thanks for those answers there. And now we're going to um, take some time to uh, try to answer the questions uh, uh, you all have had. Um, we will take these um, um, there are several questions here. There's uh, quite a few questions, and we'll take them uh, um, with the time we have here. I'm going to let uh, Ivalo um, take over here and uh, start answering these. So, Ivalo? Yeah, I just need to start reading the question. And we have a question. Uh, will the presentation be available? Mike, you can... Uh, yes. Um, there will be a... Um, um, on the left side, um, in the comments uh, section, there will be a, uh, it will be available um, later on in the day. I don't know what time uh, uh, Keisha mentioned that it will be available today. Um, and there will, uh, I don't know if it will be a link given in the comment section, but um, we'll wait and see. I, I believe it will be a link in the comment section. I think there's a request to, to, to play the videos two times in order probably to we did it with the second one, maybe. Yeah. Should we go back to, to the previous one? Yeah. Uh, uh, we can probably go back with the first video and play it. Uh, we can do that. Um, they're not very, very clear, actually. Um, yeah. You have to kind of study it. Um, it's probably the second video was the, um, uh, the most obvious. Um, yeah, I think it should, yeah. This one. So let's uh, take this one here. Um, this is the uh, video too.
Yeah, this is a video too. This is, um, we'll show this one a uh, third time actually. Yeah, um, just fade into it. I'll give it a try. Okay. Yeah. But the, um, uh, the videos are very, very short. And, um, and so you have to study it a little bit to see the movement. But it's, um, um, you can catch it if you see it perhaps the um, second or third time. Yeah. Um, okay, we can't see the video actually yeah. from where we are at. So, uh, but uh, maybe uh, you guys can see it. Uh, um, we are also within this uh, firewall environment here, and uh, unfortunately, the video is not running. <laughs> but um, um, again, please um, send your comments in, and uh, we can discuss these videos. I don't know how much uh, we can release the videos, but send in your comments if you if you want uh, more information on this, and we can uh, try to help you there. Yeah. Uh, here we go. Uh, have a question. Um, uh, what are the filters applied to observe these uh, faults for intermediate shaft throttle and bearing? Uh, these are basically the descriptors which we uh, already explained. Uh, different uh, tracking order uh, order filters and uh, tooth mesh frequencies. Then the, we kind of um, look at the overall picture, what is the overall behavior of the gearbox, and uh, apply our knowledge and the filters used in this particular case to, to localize the problem. As I also mentioned, uh, shaft running speed orders, these are very common for detecting looseness problems. So this could be uh, used excessively for detection. I'm running uh, down to the questions, because it's a long list. Um, so what type of lubrications were used and uh, what friction reducers added to the gearos and uh, the, the greases would help? Uh, so it was uh, the lubrication for these gearboxes uh, with the um, forced uh, pump lubrication. There is a uh, mechanical pump coupled to the high speed shaft and additionally there is an electrical pump uh, that's uh, uh, usually starting when the, the gear oil temperature rises. Uh, so the wood friction reduces reducers added to the gear oil and decreases would help. Um, I'm not sure I can answer this question straight away, but uh, what I suspect here is that um, the manufacturing tolerance between the outer ring and, uh, and bearing bore uh, it's, uh, it's uh, outside the, the, the specified limits. So, of course, uh, increasing the quality of the oil would, to some degree, prevent uh, the gear uh, damage, like uh, scuffing and uh, probably even hard end contact. But as uh, final result, due to misalignment, the, these gears will be damaged sooner or later. So what is the, the time between these stages, stage one and two? As we mentioned, in this particular case, uh, stage one was uh, about uh, several months, uh, uh, if I'm not wrong. I was, it was back in, uh, in time. But uh, normally this, uh, as I said, could last from uh, two months to over a year. So it, each uh, individual case is, uh, has to be uh, analyzed separately. We cannot uh, draw a line and uh, make a conclusion what will be the lead time in this case. As soon as the, the fault appears, we need to inform the customers and then uh, the decision will be taken on their side. We can monitor closely eventually if uh, stage two you know, uh, develops uh, quickly and uh, quicker than expected and to, to inform them to, to stop the turbine after. See, while I'm if I was talking about these, um, answering these questions, um, I just want to uh, bring up, um, I would like to ask a question to you all, um, um, and I would like to see your comments. Um, has anyone, have you all seen a bearing looseness fault similar to the ones um, we presented in the webinar? If you have um, that experience, please share it with us. Okay, if I don't. Yeah, we can go on with the questions, and we have how you choose the alert and danger limits, uh, how you set up the thresholds. Uh, that's the, 
It's uh, based on uh, individual descriptor and our experience over the years. Uh, so we we can we can set up uh, some default limits, which could be uh, at later stage uh, lowered or uh, or moved uh, um, to higher limits. But that really depends. We cannot. Uh, uh, say that uh, we can apply limits for, for uh, even if we talk about identical gearboxes uh, uh, that are part of from the same site, uh, the individual turbine can behave differently and uh, sometimes there are uh, power restrictions and uh, this will uh, change also the level of vibrations. So there's still quite a few questions yeah, here. Yeah, what, what does early detection mean? Minutes, hours, days, months? So early detection means, uh, for us, uh, this is the time when we have to uh, initiate uh, some reports and we have to inform the customer. So in that aspect, it depends if we, if we have a... a just a spalling on the bearing, or uh, it's a hairline crack. So it's, if it's a hairline crack, like in the case here, this normally uh, appears straight. Uh, so it's not like uh, uh, we see a overall progression of a couple of months, but uh, instead it, it comes straight. So the, the, the crack is there, so we have to report it. So in this case, we'll be as soon as it's, uh, it's there, we will report it. Then we have... Uh, Another question, high frequency crest factor is similar to skewness uh, cryptosis of the vibration signal. To some degree, yes, I could say that. But as, as you see, it's um, focusing on, on high frequency uh, bands. So in this case, it's uh, over one kilohertz range. There's quite a few questions here. <laughs> but thanks for all these uh, questions and keep them coming in. We want to support you here. So uh, we have a case one for case one question regarding the lubrication and oil analysis. If the gearbox housing showed signs of generated wear, why did the generated particulates uh, from the housing not show in the oil analysis? Trending of the oil analysis would would have highlighted a change, yes or no? Probably yes, but again, uh, we were given the result by the laboratory and um, the laboratory stated that the, the oil sample was fine. So uh, everything was uh, within the limit. Then individual laboratory uh, uh, laboratories could have different uh, limits or even the, the uh, and uh, if we talk about, again, for oil condition monitoring, uh, uh, I believe yes, over time. But uh, uh, in this particular case, I cannot say uh, uh, which system would detect it first. Because uh, I doubt that the uh, initial micro-movement in this bearing housing um, this, which will create some fretting and um, and then you turn to to bigger clearance would be detected by by the oil analysis. Is one x RPM or two x RPM phase training an effective technique for shaft crack detection? Well, we, we are not using these uh, measurements for detecting any cracks in the shaft, so probably it could be uh, quite useful. I cannot answer this question. A lot of questions. Yeah, Sorry if I, can, if I can uh, miss some people. Uh, uh, you but know, thanks for are, sending. It, yeah, you can uh, yeah you can uh, send the, all the questions to the mails uh, mentioned in the presentation. I'll remind you uh, as uh, as Ivalo is looking at the questions. Um, 
if, if we do run out of time, I mean, please do send your uh, name and email with your question, and we'll get back uh, to you. Yeah, we have a question. Please compare effectiveness of periodic measurements versus real-time monitoring. So uh, basically, real-time monitoring, as, as I mentioned during the presentation, uh, of course, we can, uh, in real-time monitoring, we can see and collect uh, all the data from the wind turbines on uh, periodic, uh, we, we download uh, periodically the, the data from the wind turbine, which could be like uh, one hour data, or it depends really on the system uh, setup. But uh, then uh, if we imagine that we have a periodic measurement uh, done every three months or six months, uh, I could say that uh, if we focus on case 32 and the steep progression of the bearing creep, uh, then this is very rapid increase. Or uh, let's uh, take another example of a cracked uh, gear. Uh, some of the faults really develop very fast. So this requires immediate action. So in that aspect, I would say, I would say real-time monitoring, especially when you combine SCADA information and uh, vibration data, is very, very useful. Yeah. Still quite a few more questions here. And we have for why uh, is this not detected in the oil sample? And how are the sensors attached to the gearbox? Is there a local monitoring usually? So, uh, as I think I answered the, the question. We just get the, the, the customer provided us the oil sample uh, analysis and uh, what was stated inside the sample. That was uh, acceptable condition. The sensors are uh, stud mounted to the gearbox. Uh, most of the gearbox manufacturers these, day, uh, these days, uh, uh, they predefine the, the sensor locations, so uh, it's very easy uh, to mount the sensors in the factory stage or even for the, some of the retrofitting we do. And uh, is there local monitoring? Usually, I'm not sure what's, what's behind this question. Uh, probably... It, is that related to a local team? What do you think, Mike? Um, um, if, it's, um, if you're referring to, for example, um, um, portable instrumentation, um, uh, that's not being used at all here. It's um, continuous, yeah, maybe, yeah. Um, uh, permanently installed uh, sensors monitoring system. I'm uh, scrolling down to questions. We really thank you all for all these questions. There are quite a few of them, and I don't know if we'll uh, have time, actually. Uh, many to more to uh, actually on the list. So. Yeah. Um, so can you give an, an idea of the timeline from first fault detection to actual repair before failure? Uh, if we talk about the first case here, uh, thing was, uh, you know, our recommendation was... Uh, for uh, inspection within one, two weeks, because we, we consider that the, this problem was severe. And then there was um, a lot of communication with the, with, the, um, with the site, and we had to guide them a lot in order to localize the problem, because the initial inspection was uh, indeed, indeed focusing only on the internals of the bearings, and we, we specifically mentioned in the report that the focus should be on bearing looseness. So uh, this uh, caused a bit uh, delay because uh, it was two days in a row that the site uh, were doing the inspection, but uh, at the end it was like uh, maybe seven, eight days in total. Is there an indication of the fault in bearing bow passing frequencies? For, for case study uh, one, uh, as you saw in the presentation, it was um, ball passing frequency auto race present. Uh, and as I mentioned for, for the other cases, um, uh, yes, uh, if you notice for case study two, uh, we put some plots. Uh, you will see when you download the presentation, um, there will be ball passing frequency in the race generated with tight bands of shaft running speed. Uh, 
Uh, also, there is a question, how does the monitoring of remote location turbines take place? So, uh, basically, I could say that uh, the location uh, doesn't matter for us. Uh, we can uh, monitor turbines uh, for offshore, uh, as, uh, as you, you mean remote location. This could be uh, turbines uh, mounted somewhere in the mountain or even a desert. So, uh, regardless of the location, uh, we could do the monitoring uh, as soon as we have a good uh, internet connection. There's quite a few questions, and we really appreciate that. And some of the uh, questions that may require a long answer, we may have to skip over those. Yeah. But you can please um, send your um, um, your comments, your questions to us uh, directly, and then we will answer these. Yeah, I actually, uh, just to, to mention that, uh, yes, uh, uh, I think I try to, to answer as much yeah. as possible. Yeah, but thank, both thanks, both, yes. thanks for that, um, yeah. Ivalo. And thanks again, everyone, for those questions. Um, that was, um, we're really happy to hear there was uh, interest there. And, uh, and like I said, please send in your comments. Um, we can, um, um, if you have uh, further questions um, um, regarding uh, uh, commercial um, uh, issues, um, you can talk with uh, Myron or Jeremy. Um, here are their um, uh, email addresses, and then, of course, the technical uh, inquiries you can uh, send directly to uh, Ivalo. He knows these uh, case studies very, very well, plus other case studies. Um, I do want to mention, I mean, as far as further contact goes, I mean, we will be presenting a paper at the um, AWEA Wind Project uh, Operation Maintenance and Safety Conference uh, 2017 in San Diego. That's February 27th to March 1st. We'll have um, uh, diagnostic specialists there, and Myron and Jeremy will be there as well. So um, please get in contact with them, and um, they can, uh, um, our specialist, diagnostic specialists over there can uh, um, answer any specific questions you have, and um, or we can just discuss whatever um, ideas or comments you have um, on your own um, condition monitoring requirements. But uh, if you're there, um, uh, look up uh, these guys here. Alrighty, I, I want to thank you all um, for the, um, for the uh, questions and for your participation um, and for taking part in the uh, polling questions. Uh, we, you know, we look forward actually presenting to you again the next webinar. Um, thanks for your um, comments there so we can refine and fine-tune um, the next webinar. So um, we wish you all a good day. We, we also thank uh, AWEA for their um, allowing us to uh, show this uh, webinar and also Keisha for the big effort she made in uh, helping us here. And um, remember again, um, you can, um, there'll be um, a link um, sent out showing you how you can download um, later on today the, um, the webinar. But uh, thanks, thanks, Ivalo, for the presentation. Yeah. Thanks, Mike, and uh, everyone. So we will answer your unanswered questions as soon as we can. And have you all uh, a good day. Yeah. Bye for me. Okay. Bye. Bye.